here. All right, everyone. Well, this is the official start, so welcome. Um, this is our third in a series of three, um, well, uh, speaking for wildlife virtual presentations. And this one's on New Hampshire's bats and white nose syndrome. So thank you for joining us. And my name is Zoe Aldag, for those of you that don't know, and I'm the outreach and volunteer manager at SALT. And for those of you who may not know about SALT, uh, we are a nonprofit that conserves land in southeastern New Hampshire for wildlife, drinking water, fresh farms, uh, sorry, fresh food and farms, uh, outdoor recreation, and healthy forests. So this is the, like I said, this is the final installment in a series of three webinars that we're presenting in conjunction with the volunteers from UNH Cooperative Extension Speaking for Wildlife Program. The Speaking for Wildlife Program trains volunteers to give these amazing presentations and they were kind enough to let SALT use them for the series. Uh, we'll probably schedule some more of these soon. I just, um, we're in a funny limbo of not really knowing what's going on for the next month, but. Um, so stay tuned for that, keep an eye out. Um, a few housekeeping items as we get started. We've got you all muted to ensure that the audio quality is good for everyone. And we plan to pause about halfway through to answer questions and then again at the end. Um, but you can feel free to type your chat, type your questions into the chat as you think of them and I'll track them for when we do pause. Um, to find the chat, if you haven't found it yet, it's on your computer. Look at the bottom of the screen. You might have to hover over the bottom and you'll see a chat icon. It's kind of a talking bubble. And if you're tuning in from your smartphone, you can touch the screen to see the icons and you should be able to click the three dots uh, and see the chat option there. So, so you can ask questions by typing it into the chat. Uh, the default setting is just that it's set so that only people, so, so the default is that you um, are just chatting the panelists, but to make for better conversation, we suggest that you go into chat right now and hit that drop down menu right above where you enter your text and choose all panelists and participants, and then that way everyone can see what you're writing. Um, if you'd rather ask a question live, I've had Pearl I wasn't able to allow her to talk and I wasn't able to allow Danelle to talk, so we might be having some technical difficulties. So I think chat's best, but if you do really want to answer, uh, ask a question live, I can try and unmute you. Um, but you know, we're limited by whatever the internet's doing today. Uh, but we'll do our best. So again, we'll pause in the middle for questions and then there will be time at the end as well. Um, if you want to practice chat right now, if everyone, it looks like people have kind of got, got a grip on it, but if you all want to type in where you're, where you're tuning in from, I'll go first. We can kind of get a feel for where everyone is. I think there's a good uh, smattering around the state. I'm actually out of state. Um, so um, yeah, I'll be managing the chat and I'll be looking for questions and raised hands. And don't be shy, we're here to learn and we are happy to be able to connect with you from afar, even though it's not quite the same as being in the same room. Um, to introduce today's speaker, today we have Sue Mayotte here. And since retiring three years ago, Sue, um, New, Sue Mayotte of Newfield, New Hampshire, has become very active with several organizations that promote land and wildlife conservation. In that time frame, she's attended three programs through the UNH Cooperative Extension Service, um, Natural Resource Stewards of 2017, she did New Hampshire cover in 2018, and is obviously part of the Speaking for Wildlife program. Um, Sue's a very active volunteer with SELT and has, was my original GOAT, which is our Get Outside Adventure Team member. So she kind of helped pioneer that program and got volunteers out helping on our field trips. And hopefully one day we can get back to having those field trips. Uh, <laughs> Sue's an avid hiker, a kayaker, a gardener, and just really loves everything outdoors. So without further ado, I will pass it to you. I'm going to take myself off video so I'm not distracting. 
but I will be managing the chat and I will see y'all in a minute. Here you go. Okay. You Are you good? Will you bring up the poll question? Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you all for uh, joining us today, especially because it's such a gorgeous day out. I know it's a sacrifice to be uh, inside for an hour, um, but I really appreciate this. So before we get started, um, we're going to test your history on um, what you know about New Hampshire bats. So we have four questions. So if you could just take um, a few seconds to answer these questions, and you will have to scroll down to get questions three and four. And then at the end of the presentation, we will uh, show what the results were and, and you can see if you've, uh, what you've learned in, in the course of this presentation. So if you could take about 30 seconds to fill this out, it would be great. And then we'll get started. We've got some boats rolling in, great. And just remember folks to um, scroll down to get everything. Maybe a couple more minutes. Looks like about half the people have voted so far. Um, all right, well, it looks like that is that. So I'm going to end the poll and we'll show the results right now and then we'll show them again at the end. So. So it looks like we have, how many species of bat live in New Hampshire? Looks like most people said eight. Bats will eat up to 75% of their body weight every night. Um, two most common bats, looks like it, it was little brown bat and big brown bat. And the biggest threats to the bat population are all of the above, white nose syndrome, wind turbines, and loss of habitat. All right. So. Okay, then I guess I will get started. Um, so as Zoe so said, my name is Sue Mayot, and I am uh, with the Speaking for Wildlife program, which is run by the University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension Service. Uh, the Speaking for Wildlife program brings wildlife presentations and nature walks to New Hampshire communities. At the end of this presentation, I will have a slide up uh, that will show you uh, what the other presentations are. And if you are interested um, in the future uh, to have a presentation shown live, uh, we can either set it up through Southeast Land Trust or there will be a contact name uh, regarding the presentations. Um, it's Haley Andriozzi and her contact information will be on one of the last slides. Uh, you can contact her if you have a group or organization that would uh, be interested in any of these presentations. So today I'll be talking about New Hampshire bats and a disease called white nose syndrome, which is killing millions of bats. And excuse me for my faux pas on the original description of this, I kept calling it white snout syndrome instead of white, bat, white nose syndrome. Um, so the, that correction has been made. So this program was developed by two biologists working to conserve bats in New Hampshire. Uh, Emily Preston of New Hampshire Fish and Game and Susie Von Ottingen of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So we do thank them for their efforts. So I'll be talking for about 30 to 35 minutes. And again, we'll take questions about halfway through and then again at the end of the presentation. So bats are really interesting creatures. Um, they're mysterious to us because they fly at night. So we just get brief glimpses of them. And often if you watch the sky, you'll see a bat fly by. And then a few seconds later, you'll see another bat fly by. And sometimes it's just the same bat. They're, they're pretty quick and they, they just zip around the sky. Uh, they are mammals, they are not birds, but they've adapted to flight in many of the same ways. 
So all of us growing up have been told scary stories about bats, about, you know, vampire bats. And I remember when I was a kid, people talking about if the bat gets too close to you, it, it'll get stuck in your hair. So a lot of us grew up with um, a fear of bats. And, and hopefully I can dispel some of the myths um, in this talk today if you still have a fear of them. So what I'll be doing is I will be explaining uh, some of the special ways that bats have adapted to life in the air. I'll go over the eight uh, variety, the eight species of bats um, in New Hampshire, and all of these species are listed as uh, species of greatest conservation need in the New Hampshire Wildlife Action Plan. Um, I will only briefly mention um, three of the bats because they do um, they do migrate. So I will be focusing mainly on the five species of bats that are impacted by white nose syndrome. Um, after that, I'll tell you about the disease that, is, that affects them, which is the white nose syndrome. And finally, I'll describe some ways that you can get involved with helping bats in New Hampshire. So who here likes bats? I for one do. Um, I'm always excited when I see that they're back every year. Um, and unfortunately, over the past 10 years, I've watched the population that we have go down. Uh, last year, I couldn't find where they were living in my home. Uh, and so it was hard for me to do a bat count last year. But at one point, maybe about six or seven years ago, I counted between 30 and 35 bats um, just coming out of my house. Um, bats are very important to the world's ecosystems. As far as mammals goes, they're very numerous. They uh, actually take up about 20% of the population of mammals in the world. Uh, down in the tropics, they are important for, uh, they're important pollinators for flowering plants. And in the north, especially, you know, here in New England and New Hampshire, uh, they are great for eating tons and tons of insects. Uh, bats are the only mammals that are true flyers like birds. They have strong wings that are flexible so they can move incredibly quickly to catch insects. Uh, their wings are similar to our arms and hands um, and they have very long fingers and actually if you look right here they have a thumb um, which helps them with hanging and crawling. Uh, their legs are fairly weak and are designed mostly for clinging upside down. So if they're on the ground, they can't jump up and start flying. They have to crawl up something and fall off. So that's why you usually see them in higher places so they can just fall out of uh, where they are, where they're roosting. So bats are a great predator of night flying insects in many places, including New Hampshire. Uh, they have very high energy needs, so they eat lots of insects. Um, and they will usually eat half of their body weight every night. If it's a female that has pups, she will often eat even more than that. Um, each species has its preference for the type of insects they eat and how they catch them. Some uh, bats snag insects out of the air, while others, like long-eared bats, can grab insects and spiders off of leaves and twigs. Bats are also important to us because they eat some agricultural pests, forest pests, and best of all, mosquitoes. I live in a wetlands area, and mosquitoes are absolutely horrible here in the summertime, so I'm always happy when I see that we've got a large bat population because I know they're, they're addressing the issue. So bats have a special ability called echolocation to find their way through the woods and find the flying insects that they depend on for food. Basically, bats send out a high-pitched sound and listen for the echo, which is similar to sonar. Uh, their hearing is so precise that they can pinpoint where an insect is and hone in on it while both animals are flying in the air. Um, bats' incredible sense of sound and hearing also makes them hard to catch as they can sense nets and avoid them. So this makes it challenging for biologists who are trying to tag them or to do studies on them. So often they have to take, they have to make what's called a, a, a mist nest and they put it over streams or over trails where bats will hunt in their hope, in the hope of um, catching them while they're chasing their prey and not paying attention to, um, to the nets. 
that's you also see uh, they've got very small eyes but they've got very good eyesight so their eyesight is actually as good if not better than our own so uh, bats do live a long time uh, the uh, little brown bat can often live 20 to 25 years they have recorded uh, little brown bats that have lived up to 32 years, and obviously those are tagged bats. Um, in most of the species that we have here in the state, um, will only produce one pup a year. So if a colony is decimated like by things like white nose syndrome or environmental causes, it takes them a long time to recover because they only have one maybe two uh, pups a year. So let's take a look at the life of a bat. Um, they have pretty interesting lives. Bats hibernate in the winter, um, either in cool dark, dark caves or mines in the northeast, or they migrate down south. Uh, bats have likely adapted to hibernation since they depend on flying insects for food that are available only in the warmer months. So what they do when they hibernate, like any other animal that hibernates, they lower their body temperature to match the surrounding air. They slow their breathing and their heart rate and basically just stay alive all winter. Uh, they, they don't eat. Uh, what they do is they live off the fat that they've stored uh, through the summer and the fall, and that will get them through five months of winter. In the spring, bats fly to their summer roost in trees or buildings. And a roost is a place that bats stop at and hang upside down. Some bats stay in the same roost all summer and some move from tree to tree. They start to feed as soon as they can and the females become pregnant using sperm they've stored after mating in the fall. Um, you should start seeing bats arriving anytime now. They can arrive as early as mid-April. Um, so over the next few weeks, um, you should start to see them in your area again hopefully. Um, some species form maternity colonies in the summer, some species form maternity colonies, and some roost singly in trees. Um, males will roost separately from the females, and pups are usually born in June. The pups grow very quickly on their mother's milk, <clears throat> and some species will carry their young while flying, some rarely do. All bats feed every night in the forest, navigating through clearings such as logging roads, paths along streams, um, my backyard. Um, then in mid-August, uh, the bats and the flying pups start to return to where they hibernate. And I'll talk about these habitats um, a little later in this presentation. Bats form swarms on fall nights while feeding and while mating. And by the end of October, they are back into hibernation. Uh, in summer, different kinds of bats use trees for roosting, and others, um, they'll use different parts of the tree and have preferences in the level of decay of the tree. Some use live trees sleeping in the foliage, and some use dead and dying trees roosting under uh, flaking bark or in holes. Now here, and almost everybody should know this one, this is a shagbark hickory and the bark will peel up so the bats will usually crawl under the bark and they will roost um, in the shagbark hickory. Uh, the endangered eastern small-footed bat likes crevices in rocky hillsides and on cliffs and they often use artificially rocky slopes on dams like you see in this picture right here. So the little and the big brown bats are often called house bats because they like to live in large colonies in the summer in hot areas such as rafters of barns and attics. Uh, females form maternity colonies, which can number in the thousands, and unfortunately, those colonies probably don't exist anymore, that, that size anyways. With all those bodies and the heat from the sun warming the space under the roof, the babies keep warm without using precious food energy. So they, because they're not having to use that uh, food um, to, to grow, well, to keep warm, um, all that energy is going into their growth. Um, they do uh, grow quickly on their mother's rich milk and they grow faster because um, they're in that heated area and they're not burning. Um, that fuel. 
So, bats in your house. If you've ever had a bat in your house, you know what it sounds like. Um, I've had it happen twice where I've woken up and you know that sound when you hear it. Um, it's when you get a bat in your house, probably the best thing to try is to just close your interior doors and open your windows and your exterior doors in the hopes that the bat will fly out of your house. Uh, I unfortunately didn't have that option and one time had to try to catch one in a towel, which worked. And one time my husband pulled the screen out of the window and kind of swatted at it and so flew by and, and was able to get the bat out of the house uh, that way. Um, if you don't get them out, they will roost in the house. So it's, it's good to try to get them, encourage them to get outside. So bat houses are a good substitute uh, building for these two species of bats. Uh, they work best uh, if they are large, hung at least 12 feet up on a south or southeast side of a building and are painted dark so that they heat up quickly. Two species of bats, again, the big brown and the little brown bat, like to use houses as roosts. And again, they want it to be hot, dark, and quiet, and they don't really want to be in your living room. Um, I have a metal roof on my home, and the metal roof is placed over an old shingled roof. So what they will do is they will crawl up between the two layers of the roof, and they'll, they'll roost in there and have their pups in there. Um, and it always amazed me because uh, I do have south-facing facing roofs, and it must get incredibly, incredibly hot in there. So it just amazes me that they, they can survive in there. Uh, there is much concern about rabies in bats, and rabies do occur, occur in bats, although they don't always show symptoms. Uh, this is why you should never touch a bat. If you have to handle one, make sure you use a, a good pair of leather gloves. Um, if you suspect that someone, when someone has been bitten by a bat, please be sure to call your, uh, your primary care doctor or go to the local emergency room. Um, rabies is transmitted by saliva and you cannot get it from just having a bat in your house. So you, you actually have to be bitten by the bat. So if you have bats in your attic and don't want them, uh, you can do a couple of things. You can hire a licensed wildlife control operator to do an exclusion or you can do it yourself. They will put up a one-way uh, device over the holes where the bats enter your house. Uh, so the next time they fly out, they cannot get back in. So what you should do if you have bats in your house and you want to do the exclusion, try to find out where they're coming and going, especially if you want to do this exclusion on your own. Uh, the pups will usually be born um, again in June, but from about mid-May through mid-August. Um, when the babies can't fly, that's the time you shouldn't put an exclusion in. You should put it in early in the season or late in the season because what will happen is um, the moms will leave the roost and with the exclusion, they can't get back in. So those babies will die. So to get ready for winter, uh, New Hampshire bats either fly to caves or mines or they hibernate or migrate south to uh, warmer climates. Uh, many species will migrate long distances to their, from their winter to, from between their winter and uh, summer habitats, sometimes up to 800 miles. Most New Hampshire bats fly out of state in the winter. Uh, New Hampshire does not have enough, it's called hibernicula, which are the caves and mines, uh, to accommodate all of our bats. Uh, bats require a steady 40 to 50 degree temperature and very high humidity to survive hibernation. Uh, usually the humidity level needs to be above 80%, but the closer to 100%, the better. All cave hibernating bats may gather in one hibernicula. All the hibernicula identified in New Hampshire by New Hampshire Fish and Game are in either mine shafts, and there's one cave that they suspect may be used as a hibernicula, and it's somewhere um, in the Mount Washington area. And they, they um, from what they've seen, uh, there is a large population that, that migrates to that cave. Uh, migration is hazardous for bats and is made worse by wind turbines on the ridges as they, that they follow as they fly. So just like migratory birds, with the wind turbines, the bats are running into the same issue. Um, 
So this is one of the, the reasons there is so much discussion about with the placement of wind turbines. Uh, so again, they, they follow those ridge lines. So at this point, we're about halfway through. So I will take any questions if, uh, if anybody has any. Okay, so, so, oh, oh, yeah, you back. <laughs> yes, I'm coming back. Um, so I don't have any questions in the chat, but I came up with a couple questions. Um, so about the hibernacula, just, so you said they're mostly in mine shafts in one cave, but clearly mine shafts are human made. So before we were making mine shafts, did they just do do biologists think they just went in caves or what did they do before? Okay, one of the points that I missed with that is there are several uh, caves in Vermont and upstate New York. So most of um, our migratory bats, well, the, the ones that hibernate, uh, will go out of state. So the, there's again just those few spots in, in New Hampshire. Um, one of the things, I, I did a tour of uh, Great Bay Estuary over at Pease a couple of years ago, and they have um, something like 14 or 15 bunkers in there. So one of the things that was tried was that they left a couple of them open and they tried to entice the bats to come there to hibernate, but the bats wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. And they would have been perfect spots for, for hibernicula because they're, they're very large and they would have housed just thousands of bats. But that showed no interest, but so yes, they, they do. They fly out of state and they go more towards upstate New York and Vermont for the caves. I guess they're traveling, yeah, traveling bats, jet setting, I guess. Um, so also, do, do you know how many bats are usually in, make up a colony? You... Um, it's, that's one point I'll touch on shortly, but okay. the, uh, there's one large cave in Vermont, <clears throat> excuse me, and at one point it was, it was housing between 200 and 300,000 bats. Whoa, that's wild. That's yeah. not what I expected you to say at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have, Heather is asking, I realize it's Heather War. Um, Heather's asking, are there any spots in Maine that they know of? That, that I don't know. This, pre this presentation is primarily focused on um, New Hampshire, um, but it's something I can look into for you. Okay, great. Um, so and then one of the things I was going to mention is if you have a question for me that I can't answer, at the end, I will provide my email address. So if you just email me your question, um, I can do some research on it and get back to you. So that's that's something that that I can I can check into. Great. Uh, she says thank you. Um, and Jack is asking, how serious is the wind turbine threat compared to pollution and climate change from current alternatives? Again, that's one I'll have to do some research on. Okay. All right, well, I will, yeah, I'll share the transcript of all the questions with you. So okay, make sure that works. Them. All right, um, I'll, I'm going to pop back off and, yep, keep the questions coming and we'll, uh, and if you, just type them in as you think of them and we can always go back. So, back to you, Sue. Okay. <clears throat> so, New Hampshire has eight species of bats and all of these bats are declining. Uh, that's one of the reasons that volunteers like myself are going around and doing these presentations just to make people aware of what is happening with the populations. Um, bats are hard to tell apart and for some uh, you need to get very close and you need to look at their faces and in their ears to tell which type they may be. Um, in this picture, the three bats that are listed in are outlined in white. These are the three uh, that migrate to the south. So they are the hoary bat, the silver-haired bat, and the eastern red bat. The bats I will be focusing on in this presentation are uh, these five here, which are the little brown bat, the big brown bat, the eastern small-footed bat, the tricolored bat, and the northern long-eared bat. Um, and uh, so these, again, are the five species that do hibernate. So I will talk a little bit more about those five species. Uh, so the first one is, oh, these 
species are all called cave bats because they usually will hibernate in uh, caves and mines. Uh, so this is the long-eared bat, which roosts in the summer in trees, and they hibernate in caves and mines. They prefer to roost under bark, so they like large dead trees, and I'm, I suspect that they're probably the one that will uh, roost under uh, the bark of the shagbark hickory. In winter, they crawl deep into cracks in the rock, and you can be hard to find and count during winter surveys. So the biologists do go out in the winter time to uh, check these caves and do counts. Uh, their population has declined drama dramatically due to white nose syndrome, and they were listed as threatened in uh, 2015. The next bat is the tricolored bat, uh, which are small bats. Um, they have an eight to 10 inch wingspan. In summer, they roost in trees. And the females, this is one um, species that will sometimes bear twins. And they usually are uh, solitary bats, so they will not live with other bats. During hibernation, they hang from ceilings and are often frosted by condensation. They like very high humidity, so they like a uh, humidity level about, of about 95%. So you can see on this bat that it is just covered with condensation. The eastern small-footed bat um, are endangered in New Hampshire as well as several other states. In the summer, they roost in crevices and rocky slopes, cliffs, and often the loose rocky slopes on dams, which I showed you in that earlier slide. Uh, in the winter, the eastern small-footed bat also hibernates in caves, but may use deep cracks and rocks, and are probably using all sorts of smaller caves that humans can't get into. Um, only one mine in New Hampshire is known to have hibernating small-footed bats. So now we go into the two more popular ones that are the ones that we see on a regular basis. Uh, first one is the big brown bat, uh, which is the one we encounter the most because they roost in buildings in summer and in winter. In winter, they appear to tolerate the drier conditions and somewhat variable temperatures found in buildings, as opposed to the constant, uh, consistent temperatures that are found um, in mines and caves, along with the high humidity. So often this species of bat will uh, stick around and roost in your house, in your barn. Um, and uh, again, in summer, they're the most common attic bat. And uh, often when they, they'll go out looking for insects at night and partway through the night, they might decide to take a rest. So you might find one on your porch or in your garage. Um, sometimes they will also have um, two babies or two pups. The little brown bat also lives in houses and barns in uh, the summer. Uh, they prefer buildings that are closer to water because they will uh, forage on mosquitoes and uh, other aquatic insects. Uh, and I suspect that this may be the one that I have because we've got such a, a huge mosquito population around my home. Uh, they will hold their single pup between their wings during the day and they prefer to gather in very large colonies with hundreds, if not thousands, of other bats around them. And because of this, when they hibernate in the winter, they are the most susceptible bat to white nose syndrome. So now I will discuss white nose syndrome. Um, it's a relatively new disease. It was first discovered in um, New Hampshire in 2009. Um, it, affects bats in probably the upper quarter, northeast quarter of uh, the United States um, from New Hampshire to Oklahoma, and it's a fast spreading disease. Uh, cave hibernating bats in New Hampshire have been decimated by white nose syndrome. Uh, and I'm gonna get into some statistical information here. Uh, winter surveys, of bat hibernicula have documented major population declines, nearly 99% for two species and a large declines in the other three species. White nose syndrome has killed millions of beneficial eating bat, insect eating bats. One study predicted the little brown bats, the most common that, uh, that we have had prior to white nose syndrome, may be gone from the Northeast by 2026, which is unfortunate, that's only six years away. 
Bad Hibernicula surveys in New Hampshire in 2011 truly brought home the devastation caused by white nose syndrome. In four of the largest mines in the Northeast, there were only 16 bats. One mine was completely empty. In 2009, those same four mines housed 3,230 bats. By 2015, only 31 bats had survived in those hibernicula. So white nose syndrome affects bats primarily in the winter when they are hibernating in caves and mines. And the first sign is the white fungus that grows on their nose, ears, wings, or tails. But not all affected animals show the sign. So if you look at this little bat here, it is just covered. Uh, the fungus grows in the damp 40 degree uh, cave environment and dies back in warmer temperatures. The bats will groom off the fungus before they fly. So in the spring, they'll clean themselves off and what they end up with is a scaly residue on their arms, um, but it is not visible on most bats. And then by the summertime, um, the scales have even uh, cleared off. So you don't see any visible signs of the fungus. Affected bats uh, may show abnormal behaviors. Some move to colder places in the hibernicula. Others fly out apparently in a desperate attempt to find food and warmth. They can be found dead uh, in front of the hibernicula, but often you won't see them because uh, predators will, will uh, scavenge them and take off with them. So what causes the bats to die? Um, this is a photo of dead bats on the floor of the Aeolus cave in Vermont. And when I mentioned earlier, um, the large number of bats that hibernate, the 200 to 300,000 bats. It was this cave that uh, those counts were taken prior to a uh, white nose syndrome. I'm not sure what the current uh, status is of that cave. So the bats are starving to death. Uh, they are very underweight, and by the time they leave the hibernicula in desperation, their organs have already begun to, to fail. Um, although bats have a regular pattern of waking and returning to hibernation all winter long, the white nose uh, syndrome makes them wake up more frequently and stay awake longer, burning up uh, precious stores of fat. The fungus actually grows into the skin of the bat's wings, damaging the skin, muscles, and blood vessels. Bats depend on their large, thin wings for water and air exchange. Uh, the damage caused to the bats cause the bats to become dehydrated, so they wake up in hibernation uh, to look for sources of water to, to rehydrate. Um, as of yet, there is no treatment for the fungus, but in the last few years, researchers have made progress towards finding uh, treatment. Um, for an example, in 2015, a collaborative group of university, state, and federal partners released bats that had been successfully treated for white nose syndrome. The problem with treatment is that how do you treat tens of thousands of, of animals, um, especially if they're flying because it, they try to use a mister, the, the bats will stay away from the mister, uh, thinking that it's a barrier. So the research that is currently going on, um, they are, the researchers are uh, trying to find treatments um, they're trying to figure out ways to prevent transmission. They're trying to learn more about the immune response of bats, and they are also doing genetic workup on the bats and the fungus. Uh, treatment is especially difficult because most fungicides are put on the skin, but again, how do you treat thousands of, of, of animals? Um, and the bats, like I said earlier, will not fly through a mister. They'll, they'll pick up on it with their echolocation and stay away from it. Um, the other thing with using the fungicides is there are, um, there is fungus growing in those caves, which is natural fungus. And if you treat with a fungicide, you're um, interrupting what is normally growing within that cave. So to keep track of all that is happening, um, all these different groups um, have forums and they do swap their ideas. They do meet on a regular basis uh, just to exchange their ideas and find out where their research is going. Uh, there are some potential treatments and they are starting to use those in field testing. In New Hampshire, 
um, our fish and game department has a non-game program. So they are very involved with uh, tracking what is going on with the bats. Um, they currently are sur uh, surveying nine uh, hibernicula in New Hampshire. Uh, and this is, this research is being led by Dr. Jacques Veyu and Dr. Scott Reynolds. Um, and again, the fish and game biologists uh, assist them. Uh, fish and game was able to track the population in growth in New Hampshire for several years, but then it crashed in the winter of 2009. And I said, this is the first year that they, they noticed it in 2010. And that year, the population, all but one hibernicula dropped between 50 and 98%. In 2011, the population dropped even further, with some sites being reduced from 98 to 100% from pre-white nose syndrome conditions uh, or populations. So in uh, 2015, there was a national uh, program set up for monitoring bats. So what can you do to help protect bats? First and foremost, stay out of caves and mines. Um, many of the caves and mines have, they're, they're blocked with gates like these, and it allows the bats to fly in and out, but it keeps uh, humans from going into those caves. Um, some of the, the mines in the caves have um, signage up. Um, don't ignore it, just, you know, please pay attention to that. And if you come across a cave or a mine, because not everything has been discovered in uh, the state, best thing to do is just stay out of it in case there are bats in there. Um, stay out of the caves, especially in the winter months when the bats are hibernating. Um, and one of the sports that um, has become popular over the years is geocaching. Uh, if you are into geocaching, please don't put your cache in a mine. Or if you know people that do it, please let them know to stay away from the mines. It, these mines and, and caves should just be um, undisturbed. So what can you do to protect the maternity colonies? Um, pass this word along um, if you have friends that are, you know, having a problem with bats. Um, so if you can tolerate having them living in your house or your barn, that's great. Um, if you want to do an exclusion, again, don't put the exclusion up between mid-May and August because you don't want those, those pups to get um, trapped in your house and die while the adult is out flying around. So um, make sure that you, you keep away from using that um, pre-mid-May and uh, through August. Well, you can put those up pre-mid-May after August. Um, if you've got bats in outbuildings and barns um, and you don't mind having the guano on the, your floor, the droppings, um, just leave it. Um, if, you, if it makes too much of a mess, um, you can take a tarp and tie it up um, closer to where the bats are so that it will catch that and then you can clean that off. Um, allow the, the pups to be successful um, in raising their, or allow the bats to be successful in raising their pups. So again, if there's no uh, immediate human issue, let them remain through the season and then put up your exclusion. Uh, building bat houses, again, can be helpful. Um, one of the things you can try is if you know where they're going in and out, try to put the bat house next to where they're going in and out and, and hopefully they will make the change over and, and use the bat house. So again, they have to be 12 feet up, paint them dark, South Southeast exposure and make it large. So, what can you do? Um, if you go to Fish and Games website, uh, which is um, on the second bullet town, um, you, you can report unusual sightings of endangered animals and you have to go onto their non game page. Uh, so, there are ways to record what you are seeing so that they can track it there. So if you see bats out flying in the winter months, it's a good time to jump on there and record it um, and report your uh, maternity colonies. So one of the things that I did is they do have under citizen science, you can go to it either through Nature Groovy or you can go on to Fish and Games website, is they do have a monitoring program for the summer months. So this form, 
if you can see it, is uh, site and landowner information. Um, so basically, you just you know put your name, uh, your address, and what type of structure you're seeing the bats in, and you know just ask a little bit of history about what you've done with bat reporting. And then it also has a bat colony count data form, which is this. So you can sign up to do this program. Um, and this one is more specific about the different types of conditions, but it's a good way for fish and game to track this information. And if you would like more information on bats and white nose syndrome, um, you're welcome to go to any of these websites. I'll leave this up for a couple of seconds, but this um, presentation is being recorded so you can go back and look at the slide afterwards. Uh, so we've got U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, New Hampshire Fish and Game, the U.S. Geological Survey, and the Bat Conservation International. So this is the end of my presentation. So uh, before I take questions, um, I'd like to thank the organi organizations that sponsored this program. Uh, we've got the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation and the Davis Conservation Foundation, and they've provided the, the grants for the Speaking for Wildlife program. Uh, the UNH Cooperative Extension Service for supporting our volunteer programs and New Hampshire Fish and Game for helping us put this presentation together. So before we go to questions, I've got um, just a couple more things. So again, uh, this is part of the Speaking for Wildlife presentation. This particular presentation was, uh, is an abbreviated version of the whole presentation. Uh, so if you're interested in the whole presentation, again, once we're past this, stay at home order and we can start to regroup. Um, you can schedule live presentations. Um, so some of the other presentations that are offered are reptiles and amphibians, um, a garden for wildlife, which uh, Vicki did a couple of weeks ago. She did an abbreviated version of that, plus focused on pollinators. Uh, the, na new, the nature of New Hampshire, New Hampshire's wild history, which Pete did last week, uh, birds, birds, bats, and butterflies, on New Hampshire bats and the New Hampshire uh, bugs, the big three, and these are the big three that are problems in the region now. So to schedule a full presentation, you can either email me and I will put you uh, in contact with Haley, or you can contact Haley Andriozzi, who um, is the head of um, the New Hampshire Coverts program, but she also is in charge of speaking for wildlife and her address, it, her email address is listed right here. And just tell her what presentation you're interested in and then she can get you scheduled. Um, so usually we do this as a group presentation. So we've done it for, um, you know, just setting a presentation at a library and having the public join um, through CELT, through garden clubs. So any group is, is welcome. I've done, I've done a couple with, um, just groups that are, I wouldn't think would be interested, and they were. So uh, if you're interested, please contact us. And if you need to contact me, and again, contact me with your questions, I'll do the research and get back to you. Please be sure, you know, that you uh, provide me with your um, email address. And I think at this point, we will probably give the answers to the polling question, and then we'll take questions. Okay, so let's see, and let's see what, what you've learned. So how many species of bats live in New Hampshire? We've got eight. Um, bats will eat up to 50% of their body weight every night. The two most common bats that we see in New Hampshire are the little brown bat and the big brown bat. And the biggest threat to bat populations are all of the above. Pretty good, pretty close. I think okay. we estimated the, uh, how much percent they eat, but other than that, we were pretty spot on. Yeah. Okay, so I am open for questions if anybody has okay. any. Oh, we've got some questions for you. All right, I'm gonna scroll back to the top here. 
And the first question is from Rose Aaron, and it is: Do parent bats bring their young in, bring their young insect food before they learn to fly? In addition to drinking milk, or I think it's just milk. I think it's just milk, and then once they start flying, they'll they will start hunting. Gotcha. So it's kind of an abrupt switch. Cool. Um, Pearl asked, "Why do bats hang upside down?" Which is a great question. Ooh, and I don't know the answer to that one. That's, Again, yeah. yeah, I've got I've got some research to do after this is done. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question because I think it that's is. something we just kind of assume. You know, you're like, oh, bats, they hang upside down, but you don't really think of why. Um, cool. So we'll look into that. Um, we've got a question from Zachariah Johnson, who's asked. Gang, does the fungus survive in the hibernacula over multiple years, reinfecting bats that use those caves and mines in the future? I'm my yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that's what part of the problem is. So yes. I I don't know if there's something that they can do to treat the hibernacula in the summertime to maybe kill off that fungus. Um, again, they have to be careful because there are natural funguses that live in the caves and you don't want to disturb that that fungus. Um, so I, I can't imagine that they would go in and use a fungicide because they would be afraid of killing off the natural fungus. But um, I would say because the temp temperatures and the humidity in caves stays pretty consistent that that fungus probably lives within that cave um, all year long. Yeah, so it seems like that would be the part of the issue. Um, so, uh, Tom is asking if there's a good resource on how to build a bat house and where to place them. Do you have any go-to oh. with fishing game? Oh, anything? YouTube. YouTube tells you everything. Yeah. <laughs> good point. I'm sure if you Googled it, you could find all kinds of, uh, suggestions on, on building a bat house. Cool. I'll see if I can. Oh, I'm going to send a follow-up email. Um, with a survey and a link to donate if you want to donate to support the self outreach program. We do have a $5 suggested donation, $10 for family. Um, and so yeah, and I'll include a, a recording of this. Um, and we still have a couple questions. I haven't, I haven't missed them. Um, but it seemed like a good place. And uh, so I'll look and see if I can't find a good tutorial on YouTube and I'll share that as well as part of that email because that's a good question. And it's a good time to be doing projects like that. Um, exactly. So, yeah, thanks for that. Um, William is asking, is the New Hampshire Wild History recording available to watch? Um, I have it. I'm planning on posting all of these on our website um, and I can absolutely email it to you. But yeah, I'm, I'm working on figuring out how to get them up on the website in the neatest way possible so that people can access them. Um, all of these, including Gardening for Wildlife, this BATS presentation and the New Hampshire Wild History and any that we do in the future. Um, Jack is asking, do you, uh, do any of you, does anyone know about Katherine Einensen and her work on this topic? She's a UNH PhD student. Oh, interesting uh, name to look up. If I could have the spelling on her last name, that would be great. Um, yeah, it's I-N-E-S-O-N. Okay, I will definitely look her up. Um, Scott says, there are many bat houses sold through hardware stores and nature shops. Have you found those to work? Like I have not used a bat house, so I don't know how effective they are. Um, I know my next door neighbor, probably about five or six years ago, Fish and Game actually came and put a couple of bat houses at their house. And I should have spoken to them before this presentation just to find out how effective they were, but Fish and Game was doing, they were hitting different landowners and, and putting bat houses up just to try to get an idea of what the colony counts were in the summertime. I was disappointed. I wanted the bat houses in my house. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Edie says, 
that Conservation International's website has plans for kits or bat houses, so that's a good resource. And Vicki said BatCon, which might be the same thing. BatCon is a great resource for how to build bat houses. So got a couple of resources listed there. Um, and then over in the question and answer section, we've got Lisa Cooper wanted to know, do bats transmit any other diseases and what aggravates a bat to fly out of the attic during the day or the early evening? I missed the second part of the question. So do, so first part is do bats transmit any other diseases? Um, and what would aggravate a bat to fly out of the attic during the day or the early, like when they're not usually out? Like what would cause them to leave their roosting site? I would, I would guess any sort of illness, like, um, you know, I had a bat one time it was early spring and it was flying erratically. And so we assumed that it was white nose syndrome. Um, we ended up, it ended up dying, uh, but we saw it flying around during the day. So um, illness is, is mostly what I would think, you know, whether it's white nose syndrome or something else that forces them to fly out during the day. Um, the only, illness I know that they transmit would be something like rabies. And again, you have to be bitten for that. Yeah. Um, I think bats are getting a bad rap with the coronavirus. There's that, I don't know if, I don't know if, I don't know how true it is, but there's, you know, people are saying that it, that a bat, that was what made the jump, but that I think is a totally different circumstance in the wet markets in China and all that. So, um, but yeah, so I think it's, uh, there's always the chance, right, of, of diseases being transmitted when you're kind of in too close proximity to wildlife. And that's the whole point. You gotta leave yeah. wildlife to be wild. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. A um, couple more questions. Um, Bill McClure, hello Bill. He said, can you talk more about bats in our houses? We excluded ours from an enclosed attic space because we were concerned about guano and related pests. And also as a follow-up, how do you know if a bat house is effective? Usually, I'll answer that question first. Um, usually the way you can tell if something's effective is you'll see the guano on the ground. So if you have a bat house, you're gonna see the guano on the ground. We've got, um, that's how I know when the bats are around. I can usually see the guano or the, the droppings. Um, a lot of times I don't see the bats. So we've got a, a, a side porch that they will crawl into all the cracks and crevices and I just sweep it off. Um, and if, you know, if they get in your house, um, aside from the excluder, you really have to find where they're going in and out of your house. And that's, that's the trick. So, you know, in the evening, usually after dusk is when they start coming out and you just have to kind of, you know, circle around your house and see where they are. And again, if you're going to stuff, stuff the cracks and stuff the areas that they're out, don't do it once they've had their pups. Um, so you, you may have to just go in and, um, you know, put some sort of insulation or something in it so they can't continue to fly into that area. That would be my recommendation. But don't do it between mid-May mid and August. Um, can you, do you, what does it look, what does the guano look like? Is it like, um, um, mouse droppings or more yeah, like it looks similar to mouse droppings, but a little bit bigger. Gotcha. All right. So that's what to look for. Yeah. Cool. Um, so Amanda said they discovered bats in their tree fort. Ooh, I want a tree fort. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, they installed a bat house, but uh, they never seemed to move in there. So I guess, is, is it that the old, you can lead a horse to water, you can lead a bat to a bat house? Is yeah, there apparently, they like, apparently they like the tree fort better. Yeah, so maybe, um, Maybe it needed to be bigger, if you said bigger is better. I don't know, because they don't thing. always use them. They don't right. always use them. I mean, you know, just like birdhouses, you can put them up, but the birds aren't necessarily going to use them. Right. So right. because it's probably an open tree fort, um, 
recommendations for keeping them out, I just, I don't have any because they've always got access to it. Gotcha. Yep, that's a good point. Um, I think uh, Jack has asked, what constitutes a maternal colony that would be worth reporting? That's a good question. Uh, he has several living behind uh, Borden Batten siding on, on their barn every summer. So how big would the maternal colony need to be to report it? Report anything. They're, they're interested in, in everything. So if you've got only two bats, you know, report it. Um, just because Fish and Game has really been pushing to keep track of the, the numbers. And like I said, you know, we had probably 30 to 35 six or seven years ago. Last year we had hardly any. Um, and I couldn't find where they were roosting last year, so I couldn't get an accurate count. And if you're out in your backyard and you see them zipping around, you say, okay, there's one. Um, there's another one. That might be the same one because they fly so fast that you might be counting the same ones. So you really have to count them as they're coming out of where they're roosting or going into where they're roosting. So either in the evening or, or first thing in the morning. Um, so again, you have to find out exactly where they are. And I couldn't find where they were roosting last year. Great. Um, okay. It looks like the questions have kind of slowed down. Um, and we're right about at, at 11.30. So I guess we'll, we'll conclude here. And don't forget, folks, you can email me and I can put you in touch with Sue. You can um, email Sue directly. I will be following up with an email um, with this recording. So you'll have all the access to all the links if you didn't get them. I will uh, also send out a survey that's really important to the Speaking for Wildlife program to collect data on um, how to how to make the programming better and um, and yeah we're all this we're all just always looking to uh, improve so we would appreciate it if you could take a couple minutes it shouldn't take more than five minutes of your time um, and we have a suggested donation like I said for the Salt Outreach Program that'll the link will, to donate will be in there if you haven't done so I saw a couple come through. And really just thank you so much for coming. And thank oh, you yes. Thank you all for coming. Um, it's been great. Uh, and we look forward to one day seeing you in person again, but we're thrilled to be able to <laughs> talk to you in this way. And so now as it's sunny and it's not going to be for much more this week, uh, go, and, go and get outside. So thank you. Thank, thank you, all. you all. All right. Bye. Bye. Okay, people are, people are still writing stuff, so I'll, I'll wait. I think I keep clicking off, so. <laughs> oh, everyone's just saying thank you. Thank you, you're welcome. <laughs> this is the part I'll probably cut out in the recording. All right. Okay, Sue, so I'm going to press end. I think we're good. Okay. So it looks like everyone's good, so thank you. We'll talk soon. All right. <laughs> Bye. Bye.